good day and it's absolutely wonderful to have you with us. I'm Pastor Phil. We're here in the pastor's office at St. Paul's. Today we're beginning our study of Yom Kippur. But before we do this, let's pray. And today we're going to use the words of the Haftarah, which is taken from Isaiah chapter 58 verses 6 through 9. Let us pray. It is not this the fast I choose to release the bonds of wickedness, to untie the cords of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your heading or healing will spring up speedily. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of Adonai is your rear guard. Then you will call and Adonai will answer. Amen. All right, so today we're continuing on with the uh, two festivals that make up the time of repentance inside of the Jewish faith. Now, last week we looked at Rosh Hashanah, uh, the festival of trumpets, that this makes up the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Um, it might be fair to say the Ecclesial New Year because I don't know that um, their secular calendar deviates at all from ours. So it would be a case of this is uh, a religious calendar that's being followed here. Uh, we understand that Rosh Hashanah was the beginning of the 10 days of repentance, and Yom Kippur ends the 10, day of, 10 days of repentance. So we're at the bookends last week and this week in terms of how this works. They remember that the Book of Life is being opened in Rosh Hashanah, and it's effectively closed on the festival of Yom Kippur. And during this time, there's a great deal of consideration that goes into what you've done in the last year, into the good works that you've done, and there's an attempt, a drive, a desire to increase your good works so that uh, Adonai, Yahweh, will look at you and say, hey, you're forgiven. Your name is in the book of life. But this brings us up to today. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at Yom Kippur, and this... It's kind of an interesting holiday because we see a lot of things going on. Now, inside of the uh, Torah, there's actually three different places where this particular holiday is spoken of. So, in order for us to really understand what is going on and to really approach it all, we're going to look through all three texts and then we're going to work together to bring all of it into focus. Now, one of the texts is very long, and we'll discuss this a little bit closer to the point, but uh, Leviticus chapter 16 is actually the entire chapter is what's being spoken of in terms of the Day of Atonement. We're going to be looking at uh, selected verses inside of this because there is some repetition that goes on, but we want to grab the highlights in terms of what, uh, what we see. Now, there's other passages that it just says you need to make these offerings, and we see the offerings more specifically in the Leviticus 16 text, where in the Le uh, Leviticus 23 or Numbers 29 text, we just see that there's these offerings that are to be made. So we're going to go through, we're going to look at all three of these pieces of Scripture, and then we're going to go through and synthesize them together to see in the, in the big picture what it's supposed to look like. We're going to make that look in two perspectives, though. And one is the individual's kind of responsibility and perspective, and then in the other case, it's the priestly responsibility that they carry before Adonai as he uh, calls them to work before him in the temple. So... With that being said, we're going to go through a bunch of scripture and then we'll talk about it. We're going to start with Leviticus chapter 23, beginning with verse 26. It reads, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on the same day shall be cut off from his people. And any 
person who does not work or who does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Now in Numbers chapter 29, we begin with verse 7. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall afflict your souls, you shall not do any work. And you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord as a sweet aroma, one young bull, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year. Be sure that they are without blemish. blemish. Their grain offering shall be fine flour mixed with oil, three-tenths of an ephah for the bull, two-tenths for one ram, and one-tenth for each of the seven lambs. Also, one kid of the goats as a sin offering. Besides the sin offering for atonement, the regular burnt offerings with its grain offering and their drink offerings. Now, this brings us up to Leviticus chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at uh, several verses here. Like I said, we're not going to be specific to reading the whole chapter. I would encourage you in your own time to do that. But for the purposes of what we need to know and look at, we're going to be looking at verses 6, 8 through 10, 15 and 20 through 22. So in verse 6 it says, And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. In verses 8 through 10 it says, Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring forth the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. In verse 15, it says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat before the mercy seat. Uh, real quick, I want to draw out here that our verse 6 verse does not talk about what Aaron is to do with the blood of the bull, uh, but it is exactly as it says. It's in verses 7, I think, that it talks about that he is to take the blood of the bull, um, touch the horns of the altar, and then also uh, put blood on the mercy seat that's found at the Ark of the Covenant. So we have um, that in verse 6, and then the same thing repeated again in verse 15. Now in verses 20 through 22 it reads, And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he, meaning Aaron, shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the, of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So we've got several things that we need to contemplate in terms of what we see going on here. In terms of the, the common run-of-the-mill person, we hear that they were to afflict themselves. They were to deny themselves. Uh, this goes alongside the idea of fasting, but maybe goes a little bit further because uh, this affliction was to be thinking about the things they had done wrong in the last year, thinking about all the sins that they had committed, thinking about all the, the various ways they had failed Adonai during the last year. And there's to be a focus on the remorse of sins and to actually acknowledge them. Uh, as a regular Christian, I can honestly say that there is something therapeutic by acknowledging the fact that we do sin, by acknowledging what we do wrong, and then in that receiving Christ. And we see that very same focus being placed on the Day of uh, Atonement or Yom Kippur as these things occur. Uh, we also see that this is a uh, Sabbath of Sabbaths, that there is to be no rest, there to be fasting. Now, it's interesting because uh, we'll probably talk about this later, but what they do is called a dry fast, uh, which is pretty intense. But we'll talk about that later when we discuss what they do today. Um, and then we also have to keep in mind, there's some interesting things that God talks about for those who are not involving themselves in the work of the celebration of Yom Kippur. If you don't repent, and if you did work, 
you are cut off. Uh, in the one text, God even says that he's going to destroy that person. Uh, and realistically, when you think about it, it really kind of makes sense that this would be the approach of God in terms of the children of Israel for this holiday. Because if you forgive everybody, this is a new creation and sin shouldn't be in the center of it. So we hear the, the desire of God to separate the sinner from the saint. Uh, and we even hear this kind of perspective in the New Testament when Jesus says that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. So we hear that there is a definite consequence to not doing the work that is being called to be done on the celebration of Yom Kippur. So this, so that kind of encapsulates just kind of the regular run-of-the-mill individual in terms of what their expectations are. From uh, the uh, from sun down the day before Yom Kippur to sun down on Yom Kippur. There's, there's a fast, there's a focus on acknowledging sin and uh, things that you've done wrong. Um, you don't do any work, and it's a time of repentance in everybody's life. Uh, in terms of the high priest, it becomes a little bit more specific and a little bit more focused because we hear that the high priest is to enter the Holy of Holies on this day. We keep in mind that this is the only day that the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. And he went into the Holy of Holies holding the blood sacrifices that were offered on behalf of himself initially and then on behalf of the children of Israel. Now, for me, I find it fascinating as a pastor to see that the very first thing that um, the high priest does is actually to offer a bull in sacrifice to God, not for the sins of the people, but for the sins of his family. Uh, when we look at the New Testament and see the high priestly family moving through the Gospels and into the book of Acts, they were definitely in need of, of doing this, that there was a lot of denial of the work of God. But you see the high priest being set apart and then as he's doing his work before God, he also is being redeemed so that he can do the work to save the people. That he is saved first, but he's saved under a different sacrifice. Now this doesn't mean that as you go down you need two sacrifices to make people or mankind right. Instead, we're seeing that God is making the high priest holy in order to fulfill his responsibilities for the people of God as he is making sacrifices to make them right. So there's that first bull offering that is made and the uh, high priest takes the blood of that bull, takes it into the Holy of Holies and sprinkles it on the mercy seat. Now the reason you know, because it talks about holy place in one of the place in one of the texts, the, play, the, the place and way that you know that this is in fact the Holy of Holies is because the mercy seat was between the two seraphim that were on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was actually kept inside the Holy of Holies. So the Holy of Holies being the place where the Spirit of God rested, or the uh, God himself rested amongst his people, the high priest enters into that place, makes the offering, Pushes, places that blood on the mercy seat, and then he goes out and begins doing the work of saving the people of God after his atonement has been made. Now, in doing this, we hear that there's two specific offerings that are made. The first is uh, a goat that is the scapegoat, and then there's the goat that's the sin offering. And the goat is drawn by lots, which I think is very interesting that there's no uh, criterion other than male goat, one year old, no blemishes, uh, but rather it's just you've got to have these two goats that meet these two uh, criteria and then you draw lots to see which one is which. The scapegoat is not going to be executed inside of the temple. Now, the simple reality is it's probably going to get killed when it's wandered out into the desert. But in terms of um, the immediate nature, the scapegoat is not killed as an offering 
during the ceremony for the celebration of atonement. On the other hand, there's also the goat who's a sin offering. And the sin offering goat is the one that is actually sacrificed. And then the blood from that goat is taken in, uh, sprinkled on the mercy seat, put on the horns of the altar, and then it is sacrificed in fire in the same way that the bull was for the offering, uh, sin offering for the priest. The goat is for the people. Uh, and then we go through and we look at the high priest who places his hands on the head of the goat and begins to enumerate the sins of the children of Israel. And as he does this, so sins are removed from the children of Israel and placed onto this goat who's then released into the wilderness and those sins are spoken of no more. The recounting of sin is very important inside of this. And we'll hear later on here that it uh, includes the stuff that we don't remember. So this is the biblical mandate in terms of what is to be done for the celebration of the Feast of Atonement in terms of the activities of the children of Israel. Now, Yom Kippur is a celebration that is still done in modern day. Uh, the children of Israel do still celebrate this, and it is a high holy day. Um, some of the things that I, I read and watched suggested that this is, or said, that this is the most important of the holy days. Where we have Christmas and Easter Christians, you might have uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur Jews, that they show up during these days of repentance, recognizing them for what they are. Now, as we contemplate the modern day celebration of uh, Yom Kippur, it's really important for us to keep in mind one fact. In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. The Jews have not been able to make blood sacrifice since 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. So between then and now, no blood sacrifice has been made, and Scripture is very clear that the atonement of sin requires the shedding of blood. So for them, I'm really kind of curious how it works. Because um, if blood sacrifice is required, what are they doing in order to atone for sin in the here and the now, considering that they can't make the sacrifices, and they haven't been able to in, you know, a thousand plus, two thousand plus years now. So as we contemplate these things, we do keep that in the back of our mind that they're not able to fully celebrate this holiday in the way that God declares um, because those blood sacrifices cannot be made. Now, um, the way that they do, in fact, celebrate this holiday nowadays is one of the things that they do for about 25 hours, 26 hours, is they have what's called a dry fast. Now, the dry fast is there's no food, no water, um, that they can't eat or drink anything. Uh, they're not allowed to wear like pretty comfortable clothes. Uh, they're not allowed to wear leather. Uh, and then they're also to abstain from marital relations, that they are to be focused completely on the work of God upon their behalf and the acknowledgement of their sin before Adonai and receiving absolution. Uh, I did he read and hear in more than one place that uh, the color that's worn during this time is the color white, that uh, they're anticipating the cleanliness that comes from God and the forgiveness that comes in that is they're freed of sin. The language that was employed by many people was one that I found very similar to why we have white baptismal gowns and why we use the uh, white pall at a funeral, that the work of Jesus Christ is enough to take care of our sin. And they are acknowledging the fact that sin is atoned for, that sin is taken care of inside of this holiday. So uh, a lot of them wear white in remembrance of that forgiveness alongside of these other things. Uh, in place of sacrifices, currently, they go through, they fast, pray, and make charitable contributions. Now, if you think about it, fasting and praying has always been a part of uh, the celebration of Yom Kippur in terms of how the Jews or the children of Israel have celebrated it through time because prayer is part of the temple or synagogue worship. 
Fasting is something that they're told to do. But then the charitable contribution side, I think, is where it becomes a case of they're making their sacrifice. Instead of blood sacrifice, they're making monetary sacrifice. Now, this isn't a God thing. This is a, a, an us thing. And recognizing that I'm not a Jew, but it becomes a, a human approach to seeking to fill in that gap. So they follow along as much as they can in terms of what God demands with prayers and fasting, but then they also add that charitable contribution side. At the, at the finish, at the sundown of Yom Kippur, they have what is known as a break fast. Now, for us, we hear break fast and we think of breakfast in the morning, and that's kind of what's going on, but at the same time, it's something very different because it is a large communal meal uh, where they, in fact, sit down and celebrate their forgiveness. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was interesting as I was hearing uh, various people talk about their memories of going through the celebration of Yom Kippur is that the, the break fast is very regional in terms of uh, what people have. Uh, one lady that I heard speak talked about how coming from South Africa, they would have a big dinner. That it was, uh, there was meats and vegetables and it was, it was a legitimate, honest to goodness, big dinner. But she's moved to America, and if I remember correctly, she lives on the East Coast. And the one thing that always kind of surprises her, and she's still getting used to, is that they have pizza. That nobody wants to, to clean up the mess because of everything that's going on. Nobody's wanted to uh, plan out the dinner because, uh, as another lady said, it's kind of hard to plan your dinner when nobody's allowed to eat. Um, so they go through and, and they order pizza in and they celebrate together. So it becomes a very regional thing, but they still follow kosher law. They don't throw it all out the window because of whatever, but they maintain their, their kosher standards and then uh, they have this big meal finishing out Yom Kippur, rejoicing in their forgiveness. Now, during this time, they spend a lot of time, and you'll notice as these holidays are celebrated, they put focus on books of the Old Testament in terms of how it teaches them. And in this particular case, they spend a lot of time reading Jonah, that they're studying, seeing how uh, Jonah redeemed lived inside of that forgiveness. And it's a very reasonable perspective to take. I, it's fantastic to see how, uh, how it's worked through. Uh, even to the point that I'm kind of half thinking about next Lent going through and having a focus on Jonah and seeing God's work on our behalf. But that being said, that is the book that they focus in on in terms of uh, what they're doing inside of uh, uh, synagogue. There are also several prayers. There's a prayer in the evening that's known as Kol Nidre. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on what some of the prayers are during the course of the day. Uh, Haftarah is one of them. So we go through and we realize that this is a pretty intense time for them. Um, one of the questions that becomes really worthwhile to consider in terms of what is going on, especially that uh, the current perspective for the children of Israel is that uh, their, their Yom Kippur celebration is marked with um, fasting, praying, and charitable contributions is asking the questions, can forgiveness under the sacrificial system, which they still live in, occur without the shedding of blood? And we have to say no, it cannot. So even those things that they're doing don't really fit what Yahweh or Adonai tells them to do inside of books like Leviticus. Now Leviticus chapter 17 says, uh, for the life of the flesh is in the blood that I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So we hear inside of the law itself that there is a definite, distinct requirement for there to be blood offering that's being done, which really leaves me with the question of what's happening with all the backed up sin. 
that uh, what is occurring inside of kind of the supernatural realm in terms of the children of Israel because they aren't able to do these things. And I have to think in your more conservative and orthodox communities, the fact that they cannot make these blood offerings is truly a big deal and weighs heavily upon them. Now, if you think it through, it's not impossible that maybe this is part of the reason why there's such frustration inside of the Middle East, because those Orthodox Jews see the Temple Mount, and in the Temple Mount, they know that that is the place where the Temple was, and as it is there, they cannot make those sacrifices. So there's just some kind of interesting things to think about in terms of the reality that Leviticus says that blood sacrifice is required in order for uh, the forgiveness of sins to occur. Um, inside of the Old Testament, Yom Kippur does occur and is seen. Now, you, uh, you definitely know this because, well, we were looking at Leviticus and Numbers just a minute ago. But one of the texts that we can look at is from Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 20, which reads, And so you shall do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you shall make atonement for the temple. Um, this text is really important to contemplate, and the reason why I drew this into the conversation is because Ezekiel is legitimately taking away any argument that ever might be made to the, well, I didn't know any better argument in terms of sin. Because he's laying forward for us an explanation stating that there is no such thing as unintentional or ignorant sin. All sin is regarded as sin no matter how it shows up in the life of, well, the Jew here or the believer in our case. So we understand that there's no the devil made me do it approach, that our sin is ours and we need to acknowledge it and own it, which becomes interesting, especially when we think about Luther as um, coming from a Lutheran heritage, it was noted when he was a Catholic monk that he would sit there and just go for hours trying to remember every single last thing that was done. But then we also think back to the reality that the high priest enumerates the sins of the children of Israel upon the head of the goat. And it's in that place that even in modern Judaism, they go through and they recite sins. Um, inside of the Yom Kippur ceremony, uh, from what I understand, they beat their chest as they're saying them, and then uh, with every letter, there is a specific, uh, a specific sin that goes along with it, so that they're actually going through and uh, elucidating, they're actually saying all of these sins, so that nothing, they hope, is left out. So we hear here that all sin stands before God as sin. There's nothing excused or excluded because it was unintentional, it was a whoops, or it was unknown. That all of these things simply are there and that all of them, including these things, become covered in the sacrifice of Yom Kippur. Now in Zechariah chapter 12, uh, 10 through 13, 9, we hear some really interesting activities going on. And this speaks to the redeeming work of God and the reconciliation that occurs inside of the celebration of Yom Kippur. Uh, we are not going to look at all of the verses in these two chapters, but instead we're going to take a moment and kind of look to some highlighted points that are uh, kind of interesting and worthwhile to, uh, to contemplate. Now the first one in verse 10... Uh, I'll bet you'll be able to figure out what struck me on this one. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. The thing I want to highlight here is that they are looking to the one whom they pierced. And it's interesting the pronouns that are used here because it says, and they will look on me whom they pierced. So this is uh, Jesus talking. Um, and we keep this in mind that this is during the time of Zechariah, as Zechariah is making this prophecy, and that we contemplate Jesus who came after and how these things work. 
Uh, in verses 1 through 6, we hear, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to depart the land. I shall, it shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who beget him will say to him, You shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. And it shall be on that day that every prophet who uh, will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies, they will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet, I am a farmer, for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, What are these wounds uh, between your arms? And he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now as we hear this, we come to understand some really interesting uh, aspects of this. The first is that when we hear the idea that the fountain shall be open for the house of David and for the habit inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanliness, that there's a continued uh, act of reconciliation, that fount is there in order for their forgiveness. We also hear of continued faithfulness in the following paragraph because God says what he's going to do, that he's going to cut off the uh, false prophet and the uh, evil spirits. Let me see how they phrase it. The unclean spirits are going to depart from the land and be cast out because of what Adonai is doing. So we hear that ongoing faithfulness of God to his people, and we celebrate there. But then we have this false religion side of it that comes in that's the result of um, people speaking wrongly, proclaiming the Word of God, claiming to have a Word of God and then actually not, and how that affects those who are around them. One of the things that's really interesting for me is the idea that it specifically talks about the wounds that were between their arms. Now, I don't know what that specifically looks like, but what I do recall is the idea of when Baal and the prophets of Baal and Elijah back in the Old Testament were battling one another. It says that um, as the prophets of Baal were uh, becoming more aggravated, or more agitated rather, and more uh, worked up, they started to go through and cut themselves in order to get the attention of, uh, of Baal. Now, Elijah does the exact opposite. Well, he makes fun of them, but then he does the exact opposite. He simply cries out to God, and then God comes in and does his thing. Uh, so there's this kind of false religion side of it that's interesting, and it becomes blamed on natural stuff. But the, the text really leaves the question saying that it doesn't sound like anyone's going to believe them. So what we hear is this ongoing faithfulness and reconciliation that results in uh, a people who are godly following along and doing the godly thing. Which brings us up into the New Testament, and we do hear the festival of Yom Kippur being discussed in the Old Testament, or the New Testament rather. And the one passage that I want to take a moment to look at is a little bit different because they're using it once again as a chronological marker inside the life of the church. This is from Acts chapter 27, verse 9. Now, when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, and the text goes on. So we understand that this fast is, in fact, Yom Kippur, because uh, there's only two major fasts during the course of the year for the children of Israel, or the Jews today. One is at Yom Kippur, and the other is for the destruction of the temple. And at this point, the temple wouldn't have been destroyed. So that second fast doesn't apply. So there's only one. Uh, and in that fast, it also, by time, by chronology, makes sense to see this as Yom Kippur because of the fact that Yom Kippur falls later inside of the year. Uh, in our calendar, it tends to fall between September and October. Uh, it, it shifts around some, so it's inside of those two months. 
But in terms of oceanic travel or um, water-based travel over big bodies of water, you're getting into the time of the year where you just don't do it if you're using a sailboat. Now our modern ships can handle them, handle uh, late season storms relatively easily, but back in Paul's day, that was not the case. And we hear shortly after this reading how they did in fact uh, shipwreck. But we have the, the use of Yom Kippur as a chronological marker inside of the life of Paul. And it's interesting because we actually hear Paul, it sounds like having observed the fast because the fast was already over. All of this brings us to the idea of what the focal point of Yom Kippur is. And as we contemplate this, we understand that this focal point is in fact reconciliation, is peace with God. And it's through the shedding of blood, the cleansing of sin, and then sin being removed or atoned from the children of Israel. Now for us, we see this in a very different light. Because as Christians, we understand that we don't make blood sacrifices anymore because the ultimate blood sacrifice was made. As we begin to think in terms of this, I want to draw your attention to some of the activity that's kind of interesting in terms of the curtain inside of the temple during Jesus' crucifixion. In Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46, it reads, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. It's important to remember that Jesus hasn't died yet. He's hanging on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So we hear interesting things occurring around the death of Jesus that would lead to believe that, or that would lead us to understand that Jesus' sacrifice is completely sufficient. God himself is no longer separated from mankind. And throughout the Old Testament, we can see these cases where that separation occurs, beginning with Adam and Eve. Because in Genesis chapter 3, we hear Adam and Eve hiding from the presence of God as he came into the garden. In 2 Chronicles 5, we hear of the priest running out of the temple because of the Shekinah glory of God descending upon the temple as they were uh, dedicating it, consecrating it to service for the Lord. And we hear here that at the death of Jesus, the curtain that separated mankind from God is torn in two. It's torn in half, meaning that atonement has been made. Now, I would contend that this is not that God was being allowed out of the Holy of Holies, but that mankind was allowed in because sin was no longer occurring. Sin was, well, sin is occurring, but it was no longer a dividing factor because the sacrifice to make mankind right had occurred. Jesus' death does everything, and by his blood, we're healed, and we are at peace with God. And because we are at peace with God, that veil is no longer needed. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23 says, And by him, by Jesus, uh, reconciled all things to himself. Uh, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of Jesus' cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became so a writer. In this particular text, we go through and we hear... Um, proclamation that the blood of Jesus is everything that is necessary and that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us right as it is the way by which uh, we are no longer alienated or no longer enemies to God himself. This becomes echoed again in Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to, on, 
to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood, through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. What we hear Paul talking about here is, and we keep in mind that Paul was a well-educated Jew, that he understands Jesus as being the ultimate and complete sacrifice. That all sin was being removed in anticipation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That all those sacrifices prior were simply acting as... uh, a foreshadowing of what was yet to come. And it was having faith in this that faith in Christ was had and that in His blood and His righteousness we become right before the Father and that atonement is made. It's really an extraordinary thing. But this moves us into the idea of understanding the work of uh, Jesus and I think Hebrews is probably one of the most beautiful places where it becomes discussed. Um, and we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 28. But we're not going to look at the whole thing in a single chunk. We're going to uh, break this up into three pieces. First, we're going to look at uh, verses 11 through 15. And as we listen to this, we're going to hear how we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. Uh, it reads, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So we hear the writer of Hebrews here very clearly laying out the fact that all the sacrifices that were made had to be made again, that they were incomplete that they didn't cover everything. And every year, the high priest had to go through, enumerate the sins on the scapegoat, send the scapegoat out, sacrifice the goat as an atonement for sin, sacrifice a bull as an atonement for sin. And in all of these things, we even go through to hear the writer of Hebrews explaining to us that Jesus did not have to sacrifice a bull on his behalf. He entered into the holy place as God, as perfect. And it was there that he offered his blood on our behalf. So we become cleansed not by all the sacrifices that were made in the past and that the Jews would probably continue making, but instead we become cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our atonement is by the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf 2,000 years ago that was good enough to cover all of mankind throughout mankind's history. It was retroactive and it was proactive. It went into the past and it went into the future. And it was here that we hear the blood of Christ acting for us as it was shed by the Son of God on our behalf. In verses 16 through 22, we also hear that it is required that the shedding of blood occur for forgiveness. And this is specifically spoken of in verse 22. uh, This reads, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacles and all the vessels of ministry, and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood. 
and without shedding blood, there is no remission. Now, this is a big thing that's being spoken of here because we're hearing that death is a requirement of the covenant. Um, for us, we would contemplate it in terms of a will. That uh, in order for a will to be opened and an estate to be uh, dispersed, the person has to die. This doesn't occur, you know, you don't write your will when you're 40, and then when you're 42, it gets dispersed around to everybody who's there. Instead, we hear that there's death that's required in order for the fulfillment of the covenant to occur, and it's in Christ that this happens. But the writer of Hebrews, having explained this in the previous section, comes into this section explaining how this has been the case since the law was provided to Moses. That that blood was shed, that death was had, and that in this there was the command of God in order for mankind to be made right because the shedding of blood is required for mankind to be at peace, for there to be an atonement. Uh, whenever you read about the covenants that were made with Abraham or Moses or David or whomever, there's always the shedding of blood that occurs. There's always sacrifices that occur because it must be had in order to uh, seal the agreement. And in this particular case, we hear that that blood is the purifying act and that outside of this, there is no remission. Jesus had to die, and he did. He died upon the cross, and it's his blood that makes us right. And that's why to this day we still do not have to have animal sacrifices because the blood of Jesus Christ was enough to make mankind right throughout all eternity. Now this moves us into the last little section uh, in verses 23 through 28. And it reads, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves which better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that she, he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place once a year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So we hear and hear that the blood of Christ forgives all, that he sacrificed himself once and that once was sufficient, and we anticipate that greater day, that better day, when Jesus returns for us, and this is what we await, and that is our ultimate salvation. Yes, we are saved right now. Yes, we have salvation in Jesus Christ, but we anticipate the fullness of it. We anticipate the day that Jesus returns. We see him and we spend eternity with our Lord because at this very moment he stands at the right hand of the Father. He stands in the holy place for us as our great high priest who offered himself his own perfect precious blood that sin might be remitted and that peace might be had with God. It's an extraordinary thing as we see uh, the Day of Atonement back in Leviticus and Numbers being seen again um, in Hebrews primarily, reflecting the work that Jesus did as high priest and sacrifice to make ourselves right. That Jesus himself lived that perfect life, and because he lived that perfect life, no additional sacrifice was necessary. He himself offered his blood on our behalf and went into the holy place, and there offered his blood that we might be made right into this day. We are still made right by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we rejoice and we celebrate this. So to kind of wrap things up, we keep in mind that uh, Yom Kippur is about the forgiveness of sins. We also understand it as kind of a placeholder in anticipation of the fulfillment of this celebration uh, when Jesus comes and in his suffering, death, and resurrection on our behalf. And we remember these things and see Jesus in these ways as he is both our high priest and sacrifice, that he entered the holy place once for all for us, that he offered his blood that we might be saved, and that the sacrifice of Jesus is one and done. It's once and complete. There's nothing else left for us to do. We simply live in the glory of what Jesus Christ did. We live in the here and the now in his gospel rest, and we proclaim forgiveness 
only through Jesus Christ. Mankind cannot make themselves right before God by right works because blood sacrifice is required for redemption. Mankind cannot offer anything that would make us right before God. Instead, we see this only through Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to join together and celebrate the Feast of Sukkot, which is the, fe uh, the Festival of Tabernacles. Until then, I'm Pastor Phil. We're here in the church office. It was wonderful having you along with us, and I pray that God blesses you as you go forward into the world around us. I'm Pastor Phil, and we're here inside the sanctuary at St. Paul's. And right now, I want to make an appeal to you. At this point, you're probably thinking this is where Pastor Phil is going to ask to help financially. And the truth is, it couldn't be further from the truth. What I'm actually going to ask you to do is to act on behalf of myself and the churches that I serve. So what I would like to ask for you to do is to come alongside of St. Paul's Emmanuel and cross-threaded my page in order to proclaim the gospel message along with us. You just either heard Bible class worship or a morning meditation. And what I would request of you is if this helped you, if this spoke to you, that you would act on behalf of the church. Now to act, all I'm asking for you to do is to share the video. I don't want you to do anything else. I just want you to share the video. Whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, my request would be that you would share the video on that platform. Show the work that we're doing. Proclaim the message of Jesus Christ alongside of us. If you share the video, go ahead and hit that like button for us as well so that we know that you've seen it and we know that it's touched you subscribe to the various platforms as well. If you follow alongside of YouTube, hit the subscribe button there. If you follow alongside in Facebook, hit that subscribe button there. And in doing this, you'll make sure that you get or continue to receive everything that we're doing at St. Paul's and Emmanuel. That is my request. Super simple, super easy, nothing major. I ask that if you, uh, that you come alongside of us, I ask you simply to like, share, and subscribe. If this work has done anything to assist you, to speak to you, to bring joy into your life, I pray that God blesses you and that he's present in your life and that your faith grow and increase, that the kingdom of God might grow and increase and that more might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'm Pastor Phil. We're here in St. Paul's. God bless.